So yeah, uh, is this working? Yes, it is working. Hi, I wanted to say hello. Um, around the year 2012 sometime, I was listening to BBC Radio 4, and there was some cyber guy on a political program talking about the dark web. And it's filled with these sites that have bulletproof security, and you can buy drugs and guns and pornography. And I thought, awesome, I must try this at once. Um, <clears throat> it turns out he was fibbing. Uh, the dark net is not as scary as advertised. Even if you have bulletproof security networking, doesn't mean that your PHP website will not get popped by the feds and they will own you. Uh, however, a couple of years later, I was working at Facebook and we deployed a Onion site, which is the same kind of site that you see uh, on tour, advertised as being part of the dark web, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we did this for a bunch of reasons that I'm going to get into in a minute. But after a couple of years after that, uh, I was feeling sort of a bit tired, uh, overworked, and so forth, quit. Um, then taught myself Nginx and Lua, and went and did exactly the same for the New York Times. So why would you want to have an Onion site? And the answer is, that first up, from a social perspective. You have a community or you have an audience. People want to come to your website, and for some reason, access to content may be hampered for them. Uh, so uh, they might go to a fake website if someone else controls their DNS. Uh, they might have credential theft, people trying to steal their actual social media or other website credentials in order to break into the site that they were actually trying to uh, get into in the first place. And for others, it's simply they want more privacy, they want more trust. Um, and I'd just like to reassure anyone who's trying to keep up and take notes, the deck will be fully available to you at the end of this, this uh, presentation. I'll tell you how to get a hold of that. So, the social value of Onion networking when crossed with technology is you get greater assurance. If you go to Facebook core www.onion, which is the publicized Facebook Onion address, you are definitely talking to Facebook. And you're talking to the core web infrastructure at Facebook because we got lucked out when we were uh, mining an Onion address and we backgrounded it into that. Uh, it's got great availability and privacy, especially in places where the networks are flaky or censored or firewalled or other things like that happen. You have fewer digital footprints left behind because the Tor software which people use to access these websites tends to take a little bit more care of security of what gets written to disk and what gets left behind on your hard drive. What is the tech value of uh, Onion, which is why I'm here at NLUG, uh, NLUG, uh, because it's like, what, what's the geek potential? Nobody talks about the geek potential. Everybody talks about the social stuff and the weird architectures and so on that are used to enable anonymity and the dark web. But actually, there's some really cool technology in there, too. Uh, to backfill a little more information, though, is it available on desktop and mobile? Yes, you can get the integrated browser for your desktop or laptop and so forth, but you can also get equivalent ones for your Android or your iPhone. And here's a um, snapshot of a video of me playing New York Times video uh, on my phone, this phone here, uh, just to prove that it works. Admittedly, not moving picture. Terribly sorry, was a bit lazy. Anyway, what is dot .onion? Uh, this thing which Bill alluded to a little bit earlier as not being net neutral. It is net neutral. Uh, what is it? It's the top level domain name that is associated with the onion namespace. And I've just dropped yet more meaningless verbiage in there. So what is a namespace? It's what an address uh, means and looks like. So IPv4 namespace looks like this. 192.168.1.1. Hopefully everybody's seen that. IPv6, you've got blobs of hexadecimal with lots of colons in between it. DNS addresses look like www.foo.com. And onion addresses look like some string of base32 gibberish with .onion at the end. How do they work? Well, you type them into a browser. <laughs> uh, HTTP, colon, slash, slash, whatever in the IPv4 namespace, browsers understand that, and they connect, make an IPv4 connection. IPv6 similarly, but you need magic square brackets picked out in red because browsers are not smart enough to parse the different um, strings with colons in with letters and numbers because um, Tim Berners-Lee didn't think of that one. 
Uh, DNS, everyone knows DNS in this room, I suspect. And Onion is, you need a Tor-enabled browser, but otherwise it's just a little browser. It's a, typically nor it's a very normal browser with a little extra software running. They all, all of these connect you to a remote computer. Why is it different is that Onion is actually a raw network address. It's exactly like 192.168.1.1 or this big, big hexadecimal blob of IPv6. But it's formatted to look like a DM DNS domain name. Uh, it looks like .co.uk or .com or something. It's got .onion at the end, which means that browsers treat it equitably just like they would a DNS name. For instance, this would never work. You couldn't do www.192.168.1.1 or whatever. It would be meaningless. Your browser would just fall over in a state of confusion, not knowing what to do with it. But Facebook Core I. Pardon me. Facebook core www.onion is meaningful to HTTP because it still means that uh, physical binary uh, address, but the www bit goes in the host header. In an HTTP request, it goes over the top as metadata, and so the browser treats HTTP equitably to this physical network address. How do you choose addresses? Again, with namespaces, if you're doing IPv4 or IPv6, you take what you are given by and large, unless you work for an ISP or have a lot of money. Um, DNS addresses, you try to choose the name and register it, unless somebody beats you to it, and then you involve lawyers. Uh, with Onion addresses, you get a random one for free because they are just encryption keys, like PGP keys or whatever. You just create them out of the air. And if you want a nicer one than the random one you would get for de by default, you go mining. You just create lots of them and throw away all the ones that don't look good enough. Uh, more mining is better quality. How does this relate to the outside world? Well, I'll give you one little example. SSH. How many people here have done SSH? How many have put it through some sort of tunnel, like SSH through SSH? Cool. So you know that with that sort of thing, what you'd be doing is redirecting port 22 in and out of something or another. Exactly the same. Here is a little fragment. In fact, this is the, pretty much the entire Tor configuration for creating a random onion address. It will create one if it's not given one to work with. And then I say, I want port 22 on this onion address to redirect to 127001. How many people have done some sort of SSH forward through SSH like that? Yeah, exactly the same. It's a TCP connection, and I just want to shunt it to another TCP connection to a listener. Uh, and then on the client side, what you do is you say, here's your host name, something.onion. There's a proxy command to pipe it through a SOX proxy, because this is how it presents itself to the outside world. And that's it. That's how you would talk over an Onion address to the uh, SSH daemon on the machine that's running the Onion software. Reason for putting that in is I want to, you to hold on to that simple notion of just TCP tunneling over SSH. It's sort of like a, a unicast VPN into a remote machine. How do we serve Onion websites, therefore? We've got three options. One, you create a dedicated web server, and you run the Onion software on it, which creates an Onion network address. And then you just take port 80 and port 443 and pipe them into Apache or whatever. Uh, it would run as a standalone service. It would probably run duplicate or specialist content. And thereby, you would have your website on an Onion address. Very simple. Or you have an Onion-aware CMS. This is how Facebook do it. Your CMS already knows how to be in several domains at once, Facebook.com, Facebook some other country, or whatever. It's reasonably smart, multifunctional one. All you do is you add another top-level domain. Uh, you tag the requests that come in from the Onion reverse proxy from this little tunnel into the machine, and you try to respond to them consistently with URLs which say, fetch more stuff over the Onion address, please, rather than going out over the normal internet clear network. And then the third one is how the New York Times does it, which is to run a web server which primarily has all of their content on, content on it, some of which is static, some of which is dynamically rendered. Uh, the static stuff is the hard one because that has hard-coded bits of nytimes.com in the file. So you run a shim, a little bit of software, which dynamically rewrites HTML back and forth, saying that wherever you see nytimes.com outbound, turn it into the onion address, and vice versa on the way back in. And it works for the New York Times. I know, I wrote it. 
Um, there is, uh, in order to support this, an entirely free and libre toolkit, which I wrote, called Enterprise Onion Toolkit, which I give away. It's available on GitHub, and there's lots of videos on how to use it, and other sites are also playing with, experimenting with it. So to uh, summarize, there's your three different ways of doing it for your website. Uh, use case dependent, you just do dedicated Onion server, or you fix your CMS to understand Onion addressing as another alternative top-level domain, or you do bi-directional translation of input and output. So far, so good. Implementation tips, also ununify your CDNs, because otherwise, what's the point? If somebody goes to New York Times webpage and then starts pulling videos over the clear net, that's kind of spoiling it, and also it degrades performance, as I will demonstrate shortly. Uh, you don't want also to bring in other trackers and third-party websites, but you know, it's a matter of taste. They will still be going through the Tor browser anyway, so anonymity is preserved if you're worried about anonymity. But again, performance and just trying to be tidy. Um, and yeah, lo horizontal load balancing works, amazingly. Uh, NITs, you will probably need a EV-style HTTPS certificate, because, and they cost maybe a few hundred, maybe a thousand or so, uh, because of the nature of EV and of onions getting HTTPS certificates. That's being worked on at the moment, but at the moment you have to actually be an actual company in order to get the SSL certificate to permit this. If you're not doing SSL, if you're just doing SSH or database access or something else like that, you don't need to worry about this stuff. If you take payments, some of the payment providers, for some reason, they hate the dark web. Uh, so they often block Tor which might lead to bad user experiences. So sometimes it's better not to put this on the commercial services where you are actually going to bill people for money. So let's get on to the fun stuff. Let's get on to the actual technology. Onion networking as a layer three network. Um, how, who here actually knows what gratuitous ARP is? Yeah, and ARP network, okay, ARP caches and stuff like that. So what you do is you publish saying, this is my network interface, this is its MAC address. Hello, everyone, this is my MAC address to get to this IP address. You tell everyone that. Uh, and then they, they populate their ARP tables. The client looks that up backwards by looking in its local ARP table or making a dynamic query, and then it sends packets out. How it works for Onion is looks like this. You see what I was trying to do here? Flashing lights. Uh, <laughs> is that what you do is you create an onion address, you mine your cryptographic key for it, you say, in order to talk to my onion address, talk to an IP address somewhere out on the cloud, not me, someone else out there. Uh, you populate uh, you, uh, the um, distributed hash table of the hidden service directory, terminology, uh, with your descriptor saying how to talk to you, and then people can go look that up, and then people can make a TCP connection to you and make circuits over it. In other words, TCP IP is the layer two uh, link layer of onion space. Uh, but you can do, uh, there's a lot of flexibility there, more than you get with um, LLC on Ethernet. If you like uh, seven layer diagrams, here is one I created earlier. Uh, and if you've got frames over Mac or uh, cells over TCP, here's your onion address, here is TCP only, stream only, so you can't do UDP datagrams. It presents as a SOX5 proxy rather than a socket, which enables applications to talk to it more easily. A lot of things will still talk uh, SOX5, or you can use Netcat in order to be a backend for SOX5 and go through that. Secondly, to Bill's point earlier from the presentation, Onion Space is entirely flat. Everybody participates in the same network as if they were on a giant LAN. NATs and firewalls are not an issue, as for reasons that I'll uh, illustrate in a second. The connections pretend to be direct TCP from point to point. The end-to-end -end principle is restored. Services and ports are published by the owner of the website, rather than simply, you know, you run this software and it magically opens port 445 and does stuff, and it's listening on all interfaces simultaneously because that seemed like a good idea to the developer. No, you as the systems administrator have to take an explicit step to publish, a la SSH forwarding or whatever, any port that you want to make available to Onion Space. Uh, hidden service port, uh, for, oops, port back here, uh, 44422, if I want to go and put uh, open access to my SSH on port 4422, I'll just do this line and pff, it would magically happen. 
Uh, so I'm looking at this more as a sort of consent-based networking. Rather than firewalling, it's closer to X25 NSAPs, for anyone old enough to remember that, where you actually have to do some legwork to say what services you would like people to connect to. Uh, the reason for this is that 1994, that man back there and his um, co-conspirator published a book called Firewalls and Internet Security. And if you were 13 years old in 1994, you'd be about 37 now. So from that, it's a fair bit. Anyone under the age of around there is unlikely to have pinged from one side of the internet to the other. Whereas I remember sitting on machines and pinging my way and fingering my way around the Berkeley network in order to find out if Eric Ullman was online and I could send him email and stuff like that. It was, it was direct and it was disintermediated. We are returning, or we could return, to a consensual, consent-based networking uh, which is disintermediated, which allows arbitrary machines anywhere to connect to each other directly without having to fret about firewalls. Uh, I think this is a really interesting, cool place to go. Onion space is also circuit switched. The analogies with X25 continue a little bit. Uh, admittedly, you know, circuits, one of the reasons that X25 didn't get popular is circuits break, but then TCP reset is also a thing sometimes, depending on how bad the network is running at any given time. But the circuits that you set up in order to do onion networking when you're sort of hopping around inside the Tor cloud uh, are also multiplexed and reused and a whole bunch of other efficiency stuff. So it actually works quite well. It's, as a trade-off, there's a lot more cryptographic legwork and hopping around inside onion space. But the fact that it's circuit switched it makes it quite, inf uh, quite efficient. Uh, it's a rendezvous protocol that you're running. You're not running client server, although you think you're running client server. Rendezvous protocols look like this. Uh, notice that here's the server, here is our client, and both of them have got firewalls which prevent inbound connections entirely, but permit outgoing connections. So the server can create an introduction point in the Tor cloud. It can register the introduction point in the hidden services directory. The client goes and looks it up, talks to the introduction point, and says, doesn't communicate exactly directly. What it does is say, ring me back, connect to me over here. So the client establishes yet another machine. And the server reaches out in pink and connects to it. And then the traffic flows blue down there and up the blue dot up to the server. It means that the server and client both can sit in enclaves where they can be protected from all the badness of the rest of the internet, quite hidden. And they can be geographically distributed and, dis and dispersed. Uh, it provides an awful lot of architectural benefits, speaking as a former Sun Microsystems Professional Services Enterprise architect for seven years. Um, this is all hidden, though. You think you're talking to a TCP stream over SOX 5, but it's actually a lot more complicated behind the scenes. Fortunately, all that stuff is hidden from you by a very nice, simple configuration file. These introduction points, though, and all the stuff that goes on inside the Tor cloud gives you redundancy, transience, and global migration. In other words, you've got a DDoS-resistant architecture. Anyone who tries to interfere with your communications can try and block your introduction points, but they change every 10 minutes or so. And they, if they want to try and disrupt your communications with some existing client, they have to find the random machine that you rendezvoused on rather than any of the advertised introduction points which are associated with you. It's really hard to disrupt communications over Tor. Uh, you have very little control of where these things happen, but they are distributed globally, so I'm going to call that global service load balancing. In terms of hotspots and so forth don't really happen. They're smeared over the entire Tor cloud. There's a cost of latency and so forth, but that's not actually too bad. I've streamed HD video quite happily over Tor. Flaky, occasionally stops, but apart from that, it works pretty good. And there is the opportunity to recombine descript uh, descriptors for several machines simultaneously to implement a kind of DNS round-robin load balancing, which means that you can have several machines doing the work. New York Times, for instance, has got a pair of AWS machines, uh, medium instances, which have got um, random onion addresses. But the, uh, uh, the random onion address descriptors get scraped, recombined, and then published as the New York Times descriptor in order to merge the capabilities, the uh, throughput of those two machines into one. And you could scale that pretty much linearly up to about 60 machines. 
Um, Self-authentication, this is something that I really like as well, which is onion addresses are literally cryptographically trustable uh, network addresses at layer three. If you can type them in, you are definitely talking to the machine that you think you're meant to be talking to because you typed it in correctly. Uh, it is, in the case of the newer version, new generation of onion addresses, it is literally the public key uh, of an entity which can sign cryptographic descriptors. And you won't be able to talk to it or pass data to it unless it's got the necessary private key and signs off against it. So this gives you encapsulated security, this gives you authentication header, uh, header, all the stuff that you might want out of IPsec, but without having to think about IPsec. There is no certificate authority, there are no pre-shared keys, no X509, op no OpenSSL, no expiry, no FAF. The address that you're talking to is the holder of the private key that you think is associated with it. And then finally, seven, and especially for Bill, um, it's BGP hijack resistant. It really doesn't care about what's going on at the IP layer. Uh, and the, the mesh, the, the Tor cloud, just so long as you can reach it, um, you can communicate. And if you can't reach it now, you probably will in a few minutes when everything shuffles itself around to deal with the firewall that someone's dropped in your way. So if you remember one thing from the entirety of this talk, you probably know the saying, you know, the internet interprets censorship as damage and then roots around it. I think we've got too used to reliable networks. But Tor is literally designed to bypass censorship, which is damage, and root around it. So it's really good at it. And this includes the damage which is inflicted by firewalls and NAT and all the other things which Bill was alluding to in the keynote, which was one of the things that I was bouncing up and down with glee when I saw it. This restores the end-to-end -end principle. There are, however, downsides. Not big ones. Latency, lag, and circuit drops are probably the big ones that people would worry about, would fret about. It's good enough, though, for the right kinds of workload. Uh, here is the diagram of network connections that you make. Uh, like, if you are browsing the normal web over Tor, here is your browser, which is a modified version of Firefox. You go boingy, boingy, boingy in the Tor cloud, come out and you talk to a website over there. If you're talking to Facebook or the New York Times, you have a Tor browser, you go boingy, boingy to the rendezvous point, and the onion calls you back over here. Same number of hops. One, two, three, four, five to the end. One, two, three, four, five to the end. Should be about the same performance, but it turns out Tor is popular. And most people are using it in the top mode with going through exit nodes, as they're called. And exit nodes are a constrained resource. There aren't many of them. Enough to support day-to-day -day operations of Tor, but they're congested. And so you go boingy, 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 and then you choke a little bit, and then you talk to the web server. As opposed to this, which is boingy, 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 there are lots of spare capacity in the middle of the Tor cloud, as opposed to around the exit node periphery. So people, the onion calls you back over a nice quick link, and less hassle, less faff. In fact, uh, do I have? No, not that. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. But there is, of course, with, if you're using a shimmer or something else, a reverse proxy, there's that link, which is probably negligible. Not guaranteed to be, but probably. But you'll generally find that these two, the cost of them together, is less than going through the congestion of an exit node. So we're talking about a network which is direct, end-to-end, point-to-point, doesn't care about what is in the middle of it in terms of firewalls and other stuff, and will let you connect in a flat namespace. This is why I believe it's net neutral. Downside number two is you've got to learn some shit. <laughs> Probably, though, it's not all that hard, especially if you've done tunneling over SSH or anything like that. You've got yourself into the right mindset of creating a little channel-like VPN to a specific machine, which you're just going to tunnel some stuff along, especially. Tor is a bit like that, but open access. It is not TCP IP, but it feels similar. It is not an internal network. It's software-defined networking, effectively. Uh, user space daemons, you use config files with an arcane kind of historical retro syntax. Uh, it's not ifconfig, and it is evolving. But as I was thinking a little bit earlier, um, my first Usenix was 25 years ago, and I'm 50 now. So that's like half my life ago. 
Back in those days, you could go to a Unix or a similar Unix user group meeting and actually learn something new about technology. And so I'm hoping that you might go away inspired to experiment with a brand new network stack for fun. Example that I did at the end of last year, just for fun. How much effort would it take me, using the Enterprise Onion Toolkit, to do the whole of Wikipedia? Turns out, uh, I talked to Wikipedia eventually. They were a little bit upset that I went ahead and do it. But on the other hand, I'd like, I've been talking to them about doing this for three years. And they said, it did never work. Never say that to a software engineer. Um, the entire configuration file for putting Wikipedia on an onion is this. Uh, what you say is, if you see the top-level domains wikipedia.org or wikimedia.org in an email address, don't mess with them. Anything else that says Wikipedia or Wikimedia, turn it into an onion address. Brute force search and replace. Works really well. Uh, forcing HTTPS, I can add a little extra magic so that if an HTTP connection comes in I automatic, over the secure onion network, I can automatically upgrade it to 443 before it leaves by doing a bounce redirect if you enable that and if it's okay to do so. And then this is just, let's create some onion addresses and say that wikiquote.org and m.wikiquote.org go to some new onion address that we'll create. This is the resulting Tor configuration as an example. It's not big. If you're messing around with software-defined networking in Tor, this is the sort of thing you'd be working on. You could have a directory somewhere in the file system where it puts all your stuff. You can talk to Unix sockets, or you can talk to TCP IP sockets, uh, like you know, the port 22 SSH forwarder we were doing earlier. I do it over Unix because when somebody tries to DDoS you uh, and tries to tie your file descriptor table up, um, or it's a lot faster to recover than having your TCP uh, table, port table fill and um, empty itself. Bit of logging and other stuff. Uh, make it efficient single hop modes, rather than uh, trying to retain my anonymity if I'm Facebook, if I'm the New York Times, I don't mind that people know that I'm doing this. So let's just make things a little bit less laggy. Um, and then, yeah, port 80 goes to this socket, port 443 goes to that socket, and this is how many introduction points do I want to run for this Tor daemon. That's it. On the other hand, the Nginx config is 94 kilobytes and is full of this sort of stuff. However, it's all template generated and works rather well. And as I say, I streamed HD video off the New York Times site to my mobile using this, so it does work. Um, and lo and behold, everything was working fine. And you got a moderate amount of press coverage, and the people from Wikipedia said, we're still not going to do it, but at least it does work. <laughs> <sighs> Nil carborundum. Anyway. Um, then some asshole decided they were going to denial of service me and just try hammering me with connections. So I went away and just wrote some more code and set some blacklists and so forth to reject things. But I was getting a few hundreds of uh, connection attempts and requests per second on a low-end quad-core Intel box somewhere in the Netherlands which was talking to Wikipedia. And it was a borrowed piece of hardware. And I don't think CPU went above 4%. So, you know, you can hammer this but the circuit-based switching that you get is kind of efficient. If you're Unix, using Unix domain socketing rather than TCP socketing, they, uh, socketing, they can't exhaust your port space fast enough. The resources that they can try and kill and eat are fairly slender. And the only thing that I got was Wikipedia whinging at me, saying there's this one IP address who's hammering them with bad requests. So I wrote some grep rules, effectively, to switch that crap off. And um, everything, you know, everything was restored. We had a certain degree of happiness. So the Wikipedia experiment was a short-term uh, thing. It only lasted like 10 days or so uh, until they started saying, well, yeah, but you know, that might be our branding. Mm. Um, ran on some borrowed hardware, was DOS, and it worked really quite well. And it did a very good job of rendering the entire site as onion addresses. The only thing that was lacking was a proper SSL certificate, because those cost money and would have to be done by the official agency. And I have no problem with that. Video, little performance test. Uh, this is a, why are, you, why are you not, yeah, okay. It's a long video, um, so please be prepared to ask some questions and so forth. I think I'm, yeah, half an hour, I've got plenty of time. Um, this is Tor Browser, freshly loaded. Uh, this pane is going to open the Facebook Onion site. This is going to open Facebook.com. Uh, and we're going to race. So start the video. That's me sort of highlighting. There's the two tabs that I'm going to go hit. Hit the Onion button, go over, hit the Com button. 
And I sort of, so you can see it's loading .onion there, it's loading fbcdn there, and the onion one, onion one came up first. Right. And then I sat, and I watched, and I watched, and I got a bit bored, and I said, well, maybe I should click on the things, because, you know, this clearly is running a bit slow. So then I loaded another page and scroll up and down a little bit. Then I think at some point I said, well, look, is go back to the other one, point out that it's still working. Yeah, there you go. This is still loading. This is not a fake. Uh, scroll, mouse over some things. I know what I'll do. I'll go load up the Facebook page for the Facebook Onion site. So I'll go over here, edit the URL, type in Facebook core dub 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 i, and press return. And that loads, boof, and this is the presentation. Now, we're still waiting for the other one to load. So if you have a community, ah, finally, came up. If you have a community that relies upon Tor to communicate with you, it's a lot nicer to give them an onion address so the shit goes quick, and they have a nicer user experience than having them lie around. So that's the social context again, making things more efficient for people who have to communicate over Tor to get to you. But also, there's all the tech, techy geeky stuff. If you want this deck, go to Twitter and do search from colon Alec Muffet NLUG slides. That should be easy enough to remember. I put it up on SlideShare, and I'll also do some replies to that tweet where I'll stick original copies of decks and things like that at some point in the future and have any further discussions and take Q&A. Just as one final little added tweet, uh, tweet, added benefit, sorry, completely ph phasing out. Um, you remember the SSH example, the first one I did, which was just setting up a little connect to localhost port um, 22 uh, to forward your SSH connection onwards. Tor has a little twist. I don't use it much myself. I've only deployed it on my machine, but it's kind of fun. These are cryptographic network interfaces. They're not like ETH0 or HME0, which you IF config. It's a directory. It's got crypto keys in it. It's run by some daemon in your back, on the background on your machine, which then forwards stuff on. That means you can mess around with it. So you can have password-protected network interfaces. So if I'd added an extra line to this saying, hidden surface authorized client basic, Alice, Bob, Charlotte, Dave, it says the onion address that it randomly generates and picks for me, it then associates a nonce with, and these are the only valid ways of talking to these four instances of the network interface. Unless you know these four secret strings, you wouldn't be able to do it. You wouldn't even know that it exists. So it's like an IP address at IPsec or whatever, which is completely unreachable and is not even routable to, unless you know the magic password. And I think that's kind of a neat little trick. Anyhow, that's the end of my presentation. Questions, please. Give that man a mic. Oh, Guido, could you run the mic? I don't need the mic. Yeah, I know you don't. <laughs> Other people might. <laughs> um, so if I were still running a corporate firewall, I would find this concerning. Mm. And if I were running the great firewall of China, I would be under huge pressure to fight this. How, how did they fight it? The way the Chinese fight it is fairly well documented, especially if you go back to the um, Chaos Communications Congresses of the last few years. You'll find several presentations on this very topic. For instance, one of the things that they do is they send probes. When someone reaches out to the non-Chinese internet and makes an HTTPS connection to an odd port number often, but not always that, they follow up with a second probe that connects to it and then tries to talk Tor at it. And if it responds in a Torish kind of way, then they send a reset packet, forging it for the outbound connection from the Chinese um, client. Um, there's twists upon that, and there are, it's a game of cat and mouse. There are multiple ways that this is combated. In regards to your original question, you know, if you are someone who thinks in terms of perimeter security as being your solitary defense, rather than having a defense in depth, multiple independent, different, mutually reinforcing security technologies approach, Sun Microsystems, Professional Services, Architect, Chief Architect, 2000 to 2007. Um, if you're doing security with multiple layers of security, tautology, whatever, um, then you're a lot better off than just having a crispy shell with a soft center. Um, this, on the other hand, 
One of the things that I would like to do over tour, and I've never done because it would be a perversion, be fun perversion, would be running Ike over this. Uh, because you wouldn't have to worry about PSKs. The PSK is the onion address. Everything else would drop out in the wash, and then you could use this as your backhaul for IPsec that you do everywhere. Or another possibility is global clustering, having Raspberry Pis, if you like Raspberry Pis, I like Raspberry Pis, uh, which you can then ship to four corners of the world, but all of them have, the, all of them have simultaneously the same IP address, or it's rather the same onion address. They don't care what their IP address is, they're one level above this. But it would mean that in order to kill the service, you would have to kill all four machines. It would be a bit like a horcrux. <laughs> More questions? Sir? And about the speed comparison that you showed us, uh, the right side was probably also the Tor browser, was not? It was Tor connecting to Facebook.com through a, con a congested exit node. There are several hypotheses why it goes so slow. It's not a DNS timeout. Uh, it's one is congestion, two is multiple TCP connection setups through diverse exit nodes in the Tor cloud, possibly, not really sure, but Facebook tends to pack a lot of stuff into different host names, but all within facebook.com, but those would all be different circuit setups. With Onion Networking, you condense that somewhat because it's all Facebook core www.i or the equivalent Onion address for the CDN. Yes, Facebook CDN has its own Onion address. And there's another one for the upload site, though they may have um, end of life that by now and done it differently. But there's no reason when you're doing a deployment not to set up an Onion address for two or three different CDNs if you have different CDNs and one for your link shim and stuff. They're free. You just mine them cryptographically and it doesn't take too much time. And it gives a much better performance. Would you advise to run an extra exit? Would I? I don't run any exit nodes at the moment. Would you advise someone else to do that? Um, only if they felt, for people who aren't familiar with what the question is asking, um, as I mentioned earlier, Tor is essentially, although they don't use the word, that it is essentially a cloud. And there are, all of the machines, approximately, inside the cloud act as what are called relays. They are sort of stepping stones that you can bounce around between uh, in order to confuse the metadata analysis uh, surrounding your communications. The machines on the outside of the cloud are called exit nodes, and those are the ones that can reach out and touch the internet. But those exit nodes tend to get a bad reputation because people sometimes do bad things over Tor. They do bad things over the internet in general, in fact, but in this specific case over Tor, and so it's used for scraping sites and going to other dodgy sites and stuff like that. So they tend to get funded by large civil society organizations or places with a civil society mission, a bit like Mozilla, for instance, uh, do exit nodes. Um, other organizations do, but occasionally you get the police coming in saying, yes, this machine was hacking into that machine over there, and you're a bad person. And it's only because some other person came and used your reverse proxy to go and hack into some other site. So use relays. Yes, this uses relays. Using, uh, if you were going to um, suggest to people, run your own exit relays, I would say get a good understanding of what you're letting, letting yourself in for and make sure that you understand the legal uh, implications of it. It varies from country to country. I think it would be a good thing to do, and I'm sure Tor would welcome it. Or alternately, you can just pay money to exit node operators who exist. Um, there are companies that do this professionally, and you can just sort of donate money to them and say, run more stuff. Um, lots of different ways of contributing back to the Tor project without necessarily setting up your own, own exit relays. Oh, unless you'd like to. Uh, okay, someone else. Um, a about Sorry. About the names. Yes. Um, were you also involved in mining them for specific name? Yes. How did you do it? Because to me, it feels like uh, mining a Bitcoin is maximum difficult. Yes. How did you do that? I was working for Facebook. Facebook have lots of computers. <laughs> 
I, I actually delegated a, the entire part of the project to a dearly beloved colleague of mine, a guy called Matt, fantastic guy, who was up hacking on C. He was building a custom version of the onion address miner with lots of crypto code in it so that if it found something that looked worthwhile, it would encrypt it and shove it onto our message bus, and then we could look at the good ones later. And we made lots of onion guesses, everything starting with the word Facebook. And then we all grabbed a beer <laughs> and grep and a dictionary, and we went hunting. Um, and we found that amongst many other candidates. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, there's only two people in the world who have easy access. Mind you, I suppose the, the, some, of, some of the ops teams at Facebook perhaps have access to the private key. I do not. I never had a copy of the private key. I made sure of that. Um, but yeah, it's just throw lots of computers at it. And you can do actually remarkably well. I have a small Raspberry Pi cluster and leave that running 24 by 7 running onion mining. It, it, runs, it creates an eight character one every day or two. Um, but probably a few, a few per day even. Any more? Uh, you had one at the back. Um, I think I'll answer that by going a little, stepping a little back into the Tor protocol. The reason it's called onion networking is that, uh, can I borrow Guido and two friends? Come. Uh, so what I need is, right. Uh, and, uh, uh, so, um, then, if I go back over to here, uh, da, 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 we might actually need one more friend. There we go. Right. So, uh, we need w someone in a blue shirt to come and be the server. <laughs> All right. Okay. Someone has to make a picture of Yeah. <laughs> So I have no idea quite how we're going to do all of this, but it is an a, 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 um, exercise where I create a tunnel to Guido, and I send him a, a we create, establish an SSH connection equivalent. If we, were doing a, if we were doing this via SSH tunneling for analogy purposes, I would create a tunnel to Guido, and then through that, I would connect, create a concentric tunnel to you, Walter, and then I can't see your badge. <laughs> Sorry, Hans, Hans. Hans. Oh, okay. And then through that again, concentrically down the second pipe, I'll create a next one on, so to two, to three, <laughs> and then onwards to the fourth machine in the uh, connection. The reason big, and the reason this is important, I can see Guido. Oops. I can see Guido, and he can see Walter. Walter can only see these two guys and can't see where the data came from, can't see Alec. And I'm sorry I didn't get your name either. Arian. Arian. Okay. So, Hans <laughs> can only see these two guys and can pass the data on, but it means that it's hard for anyone to attribute where the connection actually came from without monitoring all of the machines in the middle. So, we're talking about onion networking. Your question again? Uh, my question was because you worked with a public key, you said the public key makes sure that you know who you're talking to. Yep. So, at any... So I've created an encrypted tunnel first, and then through that, inside it, onwards to the second, through and inside to the third, through and inside to the fourth. That last hop is maybe HTTP or HTTPS or SSH or anything whatsoever. All of these hops, on the other hand, all they know is they've seen traffic emerging and they have their own cryptographic identities and I know that I am talking to them. So the uh, encrypted channels are nested for deep, like layers of an onion. That's the authenticity that we get for the connectivity. That is what stops it being tampered with. Um, and I have set those connections up with my collaborating peers here. And amongst themselves, they would have to uh, share an awful lot of information in order to de-anonymize me or de-anonymize Hans? No. Argen. Sorry. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Be otherwise, we can do it over a beer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.
Okay. 45, um, I think we're good. Time's Thank up. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, Alec.